Welcome to Line Upon Line, brought to you by It Is Written. This is where we get to answer your Bible questions. Yes, there is good news, and here are a few verses that might be helpful to you. Here's what you got to know. God loves you anyway. He's with you anyway. So let's kind of unpack this and look at the tenses just a little bit. Oh, that's a good question. From the George Vanderman Studio at It Is Written, this is Line Upon Line. I'm John Bradshaw. With me, Eric Flickinger. Eric, thank you for being here. Good to be here again. This is where we get to answer Bible questions submitted by It Is Written viewers. And uh, it's important at the outset that we mention how someone can get a question to us. If you would like to submit a question and have us answer it here on Line Upon Line, it's very easy to do. Just go to lineuponline at iiw.org, lineuponline at iiw.org. We're looking forward to receiving your questions because we get interesting ones. What kind of questions are we looking at today? Well, today we're going to talk about unclean animals, and we're going to talk about murderers, and we have questions about the Tower of Babel and a lot else besides. But let's begin with a question from Pat. And Pat asks, why did God let the devil tempt Eve when he must have already known what the outcome was going to be? Also, there's two questions. If God knows all things, how can we be said to have free will when he knows exactly what's going to happen? Oh, that's a good one. All right. So why did God let the devil tempt Eve when he must have already known what what the outcome was going to be? Does God know the future? Yes. Oh, absolutely he does. He knows the end from the beginning. This is one of the the big things that sets God apart from, well, anybody who isn't God. He knows the future without a doubt, with no errors, 100%, 100% of the time. Hmm. So why did he allow or why did he let the devil tempt Eve? This really comes back to the heart of what it is to to be alive, to be a human being, to be who we are. Because when God created us, when he created human beings on the sixth day of creation, he created us with something special, and that is called a free will. We have the ability to either love him or not love him. Why did he create us to begin with? Because he wanted someone to love and he wanted someone to love him. You can't have love without free will. If there's no free will, then it's just kind of like, programming a computer, or I've, I've got a smartphone, you probably do too, I could record into that a little voice memo that says, Eric, I love you. And I could play that over and over again, and I would find out that someone loves me, and, and really it's just me telling me I love myself all the time. Is that really love? No, it's not. It's, it's a little weird, actually. I was going to say those very words. I was going to say it's a little weird, actually. But, you know, that's okay. Yep. So he created Adam and Eve. He gave them free will but he let the devil tempt them. Now, I want to to jump in here. Pat, you ask, why did God allow this when he knew it was going to happen? Really good question, because what was going to happen? What was going to happen is that Jesus would come to the world and live and die as a man in order to redeem and ransom a fallen world, and there was no guarantee the mission would be successful, Mm. right? No guarantee. So God was the one who risked the most, And God was the one who gave the most, and God was the one who suffered the most. We tend to look at this very myopically and say, well, I mean, if God didn't allow the devil to tempt Eve, then I would never have back pain or I never got cancer or some such thing. Okay, that's okay. But God feels every pain. God bears uh, every, Jesus carried every sin to the cross. God feels it all. And God stood by while he watched wicked men nail his son Jesus, the pure spotless Jesus, to the cross because he knew that it would be worth it to have Jesus die for your sins so that you might be saved. Jesus understood that too. Isaiah 53 says he saw of the travail of his soul and was satisfied. Imagine that. He was satisfied. Mm. He's like, this is terrible. But if I do this, they are saved. They're redeemed. They're ransomed. So I'll go through it. Think of the alternative. God could have said, not going to do that because I don't trust human beings or I'm not going to let Lucifer do whatever it is he might do. No, God allowed the plan of salvation to play out as 
bitter and as difficult as it is for God to witness sin and to feel that pain, he lets it play out because when it's over, when it's over, sin will never exist again. Nahum wrote that. And we'll all say together that God is love. Look at this big picture. It's easier to understand. Sin exists because people chose to exercise their free will in a really irresponsible way. God, because he loves you, does not step in every time you're about to do something you shouldn't because he wants you to be a free moral agent and learn through a relationship with him that leaning on God is the best way forward. Second part of this question. If God knows all things, how can, it, we, how can you say we have free will when he knows exactly what's going to happen? Now, God knowing something's going to happen doesn't mean it has to happen. That's, that's two different things. Yeah, two very different, different things. things. Uh, the example that I often hear, and it makes a lot of sense to me, is I tell my kids, don't jump on the bed. Why? Because I'm afraid the bed is going to get hurt? No, I, yeah, I mean, I hope the bed doesn't get hurt, but right. that's not my main concern. I just know that if they spend enough time jumping on the bed, sooner or later they're going to fall off and somebody's going to get hurt and daddy's going to have to come to the rescue. Did I make them fall off the bed? No, but I know it's going to happen. There are certain things that you know are going to happen. Leave a plate of cookies in the room. Some kid is going to go take one, right? Does that mean the kid was damned to take a cookie? No. Have my wife walk past the popcorn in the popcorn aisle of the supermarket. She's just, she's buying the popcorn, man. Mm. She lives on the stuff. She loves it. Does my knowing that she loves popcorn and is going to take some popcorn off the shelf, does that mean that she has to do it simply because I know she's going to do it? No. If you understand human behavior, you know certain things are going to take place. Doesn't mean you are forcing those things to take place. When you just adjust the way you're thinking about this, you see it. Okay, the fact that God knows it's going to happen doesn't mean he makes it happen, doesn't mean that you don't have free will. So there you go. Question here from Gary. Gary asks, how many different tongues were spoken at the Tower of Babel? How many tribes or factions were there? Is this what we believe to be the birth of all the different groups that we have today? All right, Professor Flickinger. How many languages were spoken at the Tower of Babel? We do know at the beginning how many. Mm. One. Yep. And then, and then something happened. How many were spoken at the Tower of Babel afterwards? Uh, 12, 15, 12, 20, 20 <laughs> 80, 86, Who knows? 94. Uh, we don't know. We don't know. But there are major language groups around the world today. There are versions of English. Some of them are more English than other versions of English. Yeah, amen. Uh, you've got versions of Spanish, you've got German, but all of these have breakdowns, nuances, dialects, if L you will. Listen to the German they speak in the northern part of Switzerland. Oh, it's, it, it's brutal. Yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't sound much like German German, it, does it's, it? It's not Hochdeutsch, High German. It's, it's a little bit different, or Schwabish. They're all dialects. They're all a little bit different. You could talk about English, speak about it. Speak about English. How's that for good English? Yeah, that's not bad. Go, go to Southern Louisiana and then go to New York City and, and grab a person from each place and try to get them to talk together. It's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. Yeah. So lots of different languages were spoken after the dispersion from the tower. Probably those people who spoke something like we know today as Chinese got together because they could understand each other and off they went toward what we know today as China. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can fill that in with major language groups around the world today. Now, is this where the different races came from? Mm. There's probably some connection there because as you have different groups of people who come together as a language group and go to a geographical area and begin to procreate, you're going to find some traits that are emphasized in one area and de-emphasized in another. So there's likely a, a, a connection there. So what you're telling me, is that if you go back far enough, we were all one race. Yep. And as the Bible says, we come from one, one flesh. flesh. Yep. I would like to think that racism isn't the problem that some people think it is. Mm. All that means is I'd like to think it's not as bad as some people say. But it exists and it shouldn't. Yep. I remember singing a song growing up in a Catholic church as a kid. How can we love God above and not our brother? Mm. 
we're related to each other. And if you decide that you despise someone based on the color of their skin or the shape of their eyes or the accent that they speak with or their heredity or their ancestry. I was in a European supermarket the other day and I said to the lady who spoke with quite an accent, European. So where are you from? It clearly wasn't a French place or a German place. It wasn't Italian. It was more Eastern European. <laughs> Her answer was really interesting. Um, our family is originally from Armenia. Yeah, lady, but that's not what I asked you. Mm. I asked you where you're from. She was Russian or Ukrainian. Didn't want to say. Mm. Why do you think she didn't want to say? Because there are, what would you call them, uh, biases. There are yeah. things that we think about one another that we shouldn't, yeah. unfortunately. If she'd said, I'm a Russian, and I don't know, she sounded Russian, which could mean she's Ukrainian or Belarusian or anything else. If she'd, she, uh, it appeared to me she was afraid if I'd said, I'm from Russia, that I might have said, oh, I so say you're yeah. a Russian, and, and, and maybe she felt like she wasn't safe around me. Yeah. So she was pretty cagey about all that. Um, you know, there's a song that we sing in church, when we all get to heaven. People who hate others based on their race need not sing that song because they won't go. Yep. Racial divisions bring with them some interesting things, cultural differences. You do things different from me. Mm -hmm. um, if you're black from southern Mississippi and I'm white and I was raised in northern Vermont, our lives are going to be really different. Sure. And it's okay. Yep. That's okay. You eat different. You sound different. You look different. You do different things with your spare time. You probably aren't doing much skiing down there in southern Mississippi. And I'm doing lots up here in northern Vermont. Sometimes you can allow those differences to become problems or problematic. Mm. The fact that we're different is okay. God made us different. Evidently, it reflects something about God, talks to, talks to the diversity that exists in heaven and with God. But man, you don't want to create barriers where, we, where, where you should be creating connections. No, uh, America for many, many years was known as the great American melting pot. Sure. So many different cultures, so many different people, so many different groups that came together over the years to make America. Um, today, it's not quite the melting pot that perhaps it once, uh, once was, but the good news is we are all one in Christ. And if we can come back to that common denominator, a lot of the problems that we see in today, the social problems would, would evaporate if we could just remember that we all are of one flesh. Yeah, all of one blood. We have our original, we have very similar ancestry. S -s -send, send your saliva to ancestry.com mm -hmm. or 23andMe you're going to discover that you're related to everybody because we all started with Adam and Eve and then restarted with Noah. Right. So we're all in this thing together. We're all one. Uh, at Babel, the languages were confounded. The, the races ended up developing over time, uh, such as the DNA that God has implanted in human beings. And we need to learn to get along and accept people for who they are and what they are and to recognize it is not God's will that we do anything other. This is Line Upon Line. Get your questions to us. Email them to lineuponline at iiw.org. And we will be back with more Line Upon Line in just a moment, brought to you by It Is Written. Hello, I'm Dr. David DeRose, a specialist in internal medicine and preventive medicine. And I've been surprised over the years in working with patients and studying the medical research literature just how powerful hemorrheology is when it comes to health. You may be wondering, what is hemorrheology? Well, I call it the Methuselah Factor, and that's the title of my book. The Methuselah Factor really helps you connect with things that can help your blood be more fluid. You say, why is that important? It's important because it can help you decrease your risk of a stroke or a heart attack, even lower your risk of cancer. But it's a whole lot more than just preventing killer diseases. If you improve your blood fluidity, your mind will work better, you'll perform physically better, and you'll decrease your risk of dementia. So don't hesitate. Dive into the Methuselah Factor. Make a difference in your life and the life of those that you love. Welcome back to Line Upon Line. Thank you again for submitting your questions. We have a few more that we're gonna be able to get to in this program. And the first one, John, comes from Amy. 
And Amy asks, how does Genesis 9, 3 uphold the differentiation of clean versus unclean animals? Okay, let's look at it and find out. Hey, by the way, I want to say this. You got questions about the Bible? Well, you got a couple of things to do. One of them, email us, lineuponline at iiw.org. We'll give it our best shot to answer those questions. Another thing you can do, go to itiswritten.study. That's where you'll find the It Is Written Bible Study Guides online. It is written dot study. You want to go there. When it comes to the Bible, it's worth mentioning that you want to read the Bible, then try to read the verse you're wrestling with in context. Compare Scripture here with Scripture there. Look at what else the same Bible writer says about that subject. But when you see a verse and you can't quite make out that verse many, many times. I'm not trying to put the show out of business, but many, many times you can resolve the, the, the difficulty simply by reading a few verses before yep. and a few verses later. That's getting the context of the verse. Okay, Genesis 9.3 says, and this is God speaking to Noah and his sons, every moving thing that lives shall be meat or food for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things? And so this becomes an apparent challenge for some people because they know that in Leviticus chapter 11, God really differentiated between certain food articles or really animals. Uh, he said, don't eat an animal if it doesn't have a cloven hoof, a split hoof, and does not chew the cud, both things. But then what about the sea creatures? Don't you be eating a sea creature if it does not have fins and scales? What about the birds that fly? Eat them unless, of course, they're scavengers and they eat dead stuff. Don't eat them. That's the general rule for birds. It's not nearly as well specified as the others. So you read that, and then you read God saying, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. What has, God, has God forgotten what he has said? No. Genesis chapter 7, verse 1. The Lord said to Noah, Come, thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. And then he says this, verse 2 of chapter 7. Of every clean beast you shall take to, to thee by sevens, the male and his female. And of the beasts that are not clean, by two, the male and his female. So in Genesis 7, God said there's clean and there's unclean. In Genesis 9, God said, <laughs> have at it. Eat everything you want. I'm making no dif distinction. Can't be the case because just two chapters before, speaking to the same people, God had made the distinction. So, Eric, how do we unravel this? So, what we have here is a group of animals that are being considered okay to eat, but it's within the context of the things that God has already said are clean. So, He says, if they're clean, I mean, originally, you go back to the beginning, God gave what's essentially a, a plant based diet to, to humanity. And that worked just fine. You get to the days of Noah and God says, well, if you want to eat the clean things, you may. And he clarifies which those are. So probably still better to go back to the original, but he says, if you want to, you can eat the clean ones. Now, he's not doing away with the distinction between clean and unclean. Sometimes people will go over to, to Acts chapter 10, much further over in the Bible, and the this, this sheet that was let down in Peter's vision and so forth has nothing to do about eating clean or unclean things. That's all about God trying to help, help Peter not be a racist is what he's trying to do. He's saying, listen, people are not clean and unclean. That's what they were taught, that uh, the Jews were clean, the non-Jews, the Gentiles were unclean. God says, no, 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 Peter, you've got it all wrong. Let me help you understand. In fact, Peter even says that that's about yes. people. Yes, yeah. he does. So Acts 10, 28, I think it is. God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. And then later on, when he's talking to other Jews, leaders, he says, oh, no, I've gone to the Gentiles. Well, let me tell you why. God gave me this vision, you see, and this happened. And so now I feel comfortable sharing the gospel with people that you fellows would think are unclean. So, so that's, that's really very, very clear. Where God said in Genesis chapter 9, just go at it and every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. It's a little bit like if I were to say to my son, hey, run on in there to the supermarket. I know, I know you're hungry. Grab whatever you want. Just grab whatever you want. And he comes out with, uh, I don't know, a steak and a, and, a, and a six pack of beer. Well, you said whatever I want. Okay, my son would know I don't mean that and he wouldn't mean that either. But that would be, boy, go grab yourself some food 
within the parameters that we have a family have set up. Right. If you can understand within those parameters, you, you would say the same thing to your son. Oh, yeah, yeah, dad can have a cookie. Sure, man, knock yourself out. And he comes in with the whole cookie jar and he starts eating handfuls of these things. What are you doing? He wouldn't do that. He understands when you said, sure, help yourself. You really meant help yourself, but I've inculcated into you good principles and standards. You know I only mean one or maybe two, you know. There are some previously understood ground rules. Yeah. And so within those ground rules, that's what we're reading here in the book of Genesis chapter 9. Question for you from Hugh. Revelation 21 verse 8 says that murderers and so forth shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Revelation 22 15 says that murderers and others will not be in the new city. Eric, can a murderer be forgiven by God and allowed to enter the eternal city? Well, great question. Let me, let me quote, either accurately or not so accurately, a Bible verse to you. 1 John 1 9, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, except murder, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That was pretty close. That was close. But it was just a little bit off, and it's that little bit off that gets us in trouble. Let me try it again. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, except adultery, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Again, that was still, really close. Still pretty close. In fact, it was dead accurate, except for just two just words. Just a couple of words. See, it's those other words that we insert in there that get us in trouble. If we just take it as it is, if we confess our sins, He, Jesus, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, there you've got your answer. As long as we are willing to confess that sin, and the assumption here is to forsake it, not just you right. know, toss it out there and then go do it again. You know, repenting is turning around and going the other direction. When we confess that sin, the promise is it's forgiven, including murder. Well, David sure hopes so. And there's uh, Moses sure Moses. hopes so. Oh, yeah. Uh, including adultery. Again, David certainly hopes so. Solomon. Solomon. Have mercy. He really hopes so. So any sin that we are willing to confess, to forsake, to repent of, he is willing to forgive. So can murderers enter into the kingdom of heaven? Yes, if they confess and repent of their sins. Now, what if there is a murderer who does not confess their sin, who does not repent of their sin? Are they getting in? No. I went to a, a penitentiary one time and spoke to a man who was guilty of murder. He admitted he was. He'd murdered numerous people. So as I say this, I want to be very sensitive because someone's watching and a murderer upended their family's life and, you know, you don't want to hear me talking um, positively about a murderer's future. Well, hopefully you can find forgiveness in your heart because that's, that's healthy and it's necessary. But I, I spoke to this convicted murderer and, 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 and as he spoke to me, he wept. I mean, he wept streams of tears down his face. And he said to me, I am so sorry for my crimes which I have committed. Those are his words. Now, don't get into the, did he do it? Is he sorry? Is he not? Let's just take it at face value and let God be the judge. He acknowledges he committed the crime. He's doing the time. And he's sorry. He has repented. He has told God he's sorry. Based on the information that we have, Eric, I believe we're going to see this man in heaven. And frankly, I'm glad. It doesn't take away the heinousness of the crimes that he committed. That cannot be undone. But thank God, in eternity, he's not going to be another lost person. He turned to God, and God forgave him, just as God forgave Moses. Moses, who led the Exodus, was a murderer. Aaron, the first high priest, was an idolater. David was a murderer and an adulterer, and who knows what else. The Bible is replete with accounts of people who've really messed up. We're grateful that Romans 5 and verse 20 says that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Let's remember that. You know, something also to keep in mind here is it's easy to say, oh, God's going to keep those, those filthy, dirty murderers out of heaven. Yeah, that sounds like a bad sin. Yeah. What, what are the not so bad sins? There you go. This is where things start to get a little, where we make things get a little gray. 
they're not that gray. God says sin is sin. Sin is the transgression of the law. If we're not repentant of our sins, whatever they may be, that's some that's reason for concern. So don't don't be concerned just about the murderers. You know the the Bible says that that pride mm. is an abomination to God. Yeah. Yeah. And you know you don't hear too many people standing up in the prayer meeting and saying, "Brothers and sisters, I thank God that He's delivered me from my pride." Mm. No one talks about that. It, it's fashionable. It's it's socially acceptable. Yep. But it's sin. Yep. So we don't want to look down our noses at the people who've committed these spectacular sins, thinking that in some way we are a little better or spiritually superior. Right. That's a deception. Okay, Jungi has this question. It'll be our last question, Eric. Acts two seventeen says, "It shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions." and your old men shall dream dreams. What does it mean? Well, I, I think to a great extent it means what it says. You know, as we get down to the last days of Earth's history, we can expect that there are going to be living prophets who, who come along. Now, we got to be real careful that we don't get swept up with the, the false ones. Yeah, plenty of them. But people who are going to be prophesying, who will have visions, who will have dreams, but we need to test those by what we already have as authoritative in the scripture. You know, a, a genuine prophet or dreamer of dreams is not going to contradict something that you already see in the Bible. They're not going to teach you something different than what God teaches you. They're going to be in agreement with the Bible, with the other uh, previous prophets and so forth. Excellent. Thank you very much. Get your questions to us line up online at IIW.org. I have been meaning to tell you for a very long time about this. We had a question some time back about tithe. This is numerous programs back. I said, I've got to tell, about, tell you about this. Then we had a question or two about angels. I said, oh, I've got to tell you about this. This is from, it is written from our children's ministry, My Place with Jesus, the Buried Treasure Scripture Songs. They are fantastic. There are 22, mostly original. My wife wrote almost all of them, save about three, and they're good. This is how you get scripture into your mind and the minds of your kids and your grandchildren. Put this in the, the CD player in your car or play it at home and you'll be really blessed. Find out more by contacting us at itiswritten.shop. That's online, itiswritten.shop. It's part of our kids program, Buried Treasure, which is fantastic. Maybe we'll tell you about this another time. But you'll get the scriptures into your mind. You'll never let them go. You'll never forget them. They're tremendous songs. The Buried Treasure Scripture Songs. I'd love you to have them. All right, friend, thank you for joining us. Eric and I will be back for more next time. Really glad to have had you here. This has been Line Upon Line, brought to you by It Is Written. It Is Written.